Hello and welcome to Forest Focus, Liverpool's in the past and we're only looking forward tonight as we do our best to answer questions submitted by you. As has been the way this week, a late change to the lineup as Mark Southern was supposed to join him but he's had to drop out. Fear not, Greg Mitchell was hoping to step in but he's running late and may not make it here. But the man to ride to the rescue as ever is Michael Temple. He is here and I'll play the part of host and panellist too and venture an opinion as we wade through the questions you've sent in to us very kindly. Temps, how are you doing? Well, mate, after that, I'm, I'm either plan Z or a square peg in a round hole, aren't I? So, yeah, just feeling really valued at the moment. <laughs> Billy Davis style, yeah, playing left back, but you're a central midfielder. You're the Chris Cohen in this podcast. So yeah, that's, that's a good thing that. to be. I'll yeah, exactly. That. A very handsome man, a very nice man, and a very good player. Right. Me or Cohen? <laughs> both. 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 <laughs> uh we've had loads of questions i've sifted through um sifted through them we'll try and get through as many as we can tonight do drop your comments in as well we'll try and make it as interactive as we can um a lot of them it's interesting how they came in the first bats were all basically what happens if we go down and there's lots of questions around that so um i'll put a few up on the screen um uh, i'll put this one up from callum but basically it's what happens if we go down so uh, I'll put it up and you can have a reaction to it, Temps, and I'll venture an opinion as well as uh, we go along. Right, here we go. This isn't the best way to do it. I might just read them out. I'm going to try and put them on screen. Callum Owen on Twitter. If we get relegated, could we do a Fulham-style approach and come back with a chunk of our current squad, or do we see another season of major overhaul? What, what is what is missing there? How, what would happen if we do go down, do you think? Great question. Well, straight away, I think we'd retain a core, wouldn't we? So... The likes of Yatesy uh, would, would, would be there straight away and you'd try to find a backbone, but inevitably some players would simply have to leave. Murillo's not going to abide a season of the championship, nor is Morgan Gibbs-White, nor is Taro Awanyi. So you think, can you keep hold of the likes of Alanga, maybe uh, one or two of the midfielders? You'd like to think you'd keep hold of... Nico, Toff, a bit of a call there. But, yeah, look, it's not part of the plan, is it? So I'll, uh, I've, I've indulged an answer there. But the, 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 the real answer should be avoid relegation at all costs, do whatever we need to do to, to keep in the Premier League because it's one of those negative, unthinkable thoughts that I, I hope nobody other than the football department at, at uh, the City Ground have to think about too deeply. We've come too far. It's taken us four transfer windows to get to this point where we've got depth throughout that spine and in certain key positions it would also allow the vultures to circle and prize away key assets for far less than their their market value so it's not part of anybody's plan it's a valid question because we probably are in a bit of a shootout with luton for 17th place and yeah it's upsetting me to even think about the amount of progress that would be undone by relegation and the amount of turnover that it would um, force uh, our football department to make yeah i mean i first year i don't think we'll go down but if we do there's different ways to approach it on there like leicester sold madison and they lost tielemans and they basically retain the rest of their squad leeds weirdly have loaned out loads of players and um, which i guess we could do with some of them and then southampton probably retained a lot probably because they were so bad last season and they had a lot of young players anyway i think i'd agree with temps we'd probably have to sell uh murillo uh uh, at least one of the keepers. I think we could keep, ironically, we could probably keep more defenders if we go down and if we stay up. So I think Omobama Delhi would stay. The two fullbacks that we've got now would probably stay. You'd build around Ryan Yates. You'd have Joe Worrell back. Um, someone, I think someone said Nico Dominguez would stay, but I think he'd be one of the first who'd want to go because he's had a good career. And Sangare would go. And then young players like Hudson Adoy and Ilanga. Maybe there'd be a, a taker for Ilanga because he's done so well. And then I suppose the big question is can you keep? Morgan Gibbs White for one season in the championship. I suspect not. But if we were to go down, it's just around can you get straight back up? Because every yeah. season you stay down is, you know, damaging. Isn't it? You look like Middlesbrough and I guess Stoke Temps. That's the that's the fear, isn't it? You've got to come straight back up if you do go down. Yeah, I mean the, the task of whoever's responsible for that player trading that period will be which which game breakers can we keep hold of? So you, you've mentioned Morgan Gibbs White there, who's going to have 20 goal contributions in the championship, um, as as would a longer. Hudson Adoy is probably a, a decent shout for, for that as well. Um, you get another year out of Chris Wood, then you've got to think he's going to do pretty well in the in the championship. Um, yeah, depressing question. 
there'll be somebody thinking about it. But fortunately, for a while at least, it doesn't have to be us. I'm still backing us to survive. I think it'll be tighter than we perhaps hope and expect. Um, but yeah, let's hope it's it's not a problem. So many cautionary tales. You've mentioned Stoke there, who were extremely buoyed by their chances at the start of the season and now find, find themselves um, where they are. That's a tale of overspending, of retaining too many players on too high a, a wage level uh, and that making your profit and sustainability calculations such that you simply have to offload players and you can't reinvest those transfer fees. So we've come too far. I don't think it will come to pass. That's it. I'm not going to indulge yeah. it anymore. Uh, as Jonathan says as well, players like Brandon Aguilera would be good. Just one other one on it. I know you're not going to indulge it, but there is an interesting question that I want to just take really. KTM Courtney uh, said, uh, financial implication ought to be massive. Would would Maranakis interest wane? I certainly don't think so. And would it impact the ground development plans? Any thoughts on particularly the ground development plans? Because I really don't think the owner's interest would wane particularly. There'd be a little bit more demolition because I think another boot would go for another telly in the director's box <laughs> if, uh, if if that was to, to happen. No, the, the commitment of the ownership is, is absolute, but it, it's a blow. He's not trying to reduce his investment. He's trying to do it in a structured way. He'd love to get into capital projects, but expanding the city ground relies on the demand that exists for being in the Premier League. It was it was 1,200 quid to be in the boardroom on Saturday, and that's only because Liverpool were in, in town. So, so no, I think that their commitment to the cause is absolute in a financial sense. It would be so galling for, for everybody. But, yeah, let's have some positive questions there. Uh, good evening to people around the world, people in uh, Toronto, I see, Texas, uh, I think Australia I saw as well, Denmark, there's lots of people with us, uh, which is great. It's good to see one of these of an evening as well. Um, as Temp says, a more positive question. So um, you, you pick them, Davis. Well, I just did them chronologically. It's interesting that Forest <laughs> fans' first instinct is to, what if we go down? <laughs> uh, here's another one. Uh, is this caponosity and function? Does that mean something? That's a person who tweets us regularly, which is great, but I don't know what that means. If Forest stay up, will it have been a Brighton-esque first two seasons? Um, clear, bar from clearing up the keeper mess, is it a time for a summer of consolidation? Who's most likely to go? Uh, I need to pick short questions that don't cut off the final word. <laughs> what would happen if we stay up then, transfer-wise, and in terms of building? I mean, my, my instinct is this: the, the season... Despite what we've seen from the, the stands and despite the perhaps more realistic and measured expectations of, of you and I, there'll be people in the ownership group and in the football department that wants us to establish ourselves in, in mid-table and we're, we're 10 to 15 points away from that. So they'll, they'll look to trade. That's been their instinct in, in every window from this point. I think we'll go into the summer window with more, more bankers uh, in mind, particularly in the... Um, in the centre mid, the the wide departments, potentially the the depth of fullback is a little bit too indulgent. Can we offload a little bit there, uh, and maybe find that definitive central midfielder or that definitive centre half that's going to play alongside Murillo for able to to keep him. Have we cracked the keeper position? So certainly seems like a solid option to 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 me at this point. So of of course I, I would hope for a planned a structured five out five in um but yeah every instinct and, and recent history suggests that there'll be some surprises in there um, and we could trade way more than we would expect for a, a team who would be entering their third year in the league yeah i agree and uh, there's a couple of comments here one from john if we stay up we'll have cleared the bad contracts harry arter will have gone as dan mentions in the comments as well harry arter must have another clause somewhere <laughs> Uh, <laughs> get another contract. If Mansfield get promoted, he gets another year at Forest. Something ridiculous like that. The, the boys are commercial genius. I think he might be. I think we see him signing for Mansfield or something like that. They do have a, a journeyman next, or Notts County. He had a bit of a spell there. Yeah, I mean, if we go down, uh, I think we'd be in quite good shape. But it all depends on, like Temp says, as what the ownership wants. I mean, like, have we sold a keeper? Question. I'm still not a hundred percent sure. He, he, he took a big step to convincing me at the weekend with that big save, but I just want to see a bit more because I remember thinking Matt Turner was was pretty solid until he had a nightmare against Brentford and just fell off a cliff. So, uh, yeah, it's interesting to to see that. I think we'll have a big churn in defence. Um, I'd like to think we can build around Omar Bamadeli and Murillo. 
but uh, we'll see. I wonder if the owner will have an ambition to bring in another big centre half. And then from there, you kind of think we've got the building blocks, or I do anyway, like Dominguez and Sangare could be a good pairing. Ilanga and hudson Adoy could be a good pairing. Uh, Gibbs-White, obviously, and then you probably need some depth around that. Um, we'll pick up on this question on a member stream tomorrow and explore it further. Hey, Matt, um, the, ma the manager question is interesting, so I'll chuck that at you. If we go down, is Nuno staying? Yeah, I think so. I think he would. I think the pressure on Nuno is can he keep pace with the owner's demands? I think this season it's a case of stay up. And next season, I think the owner would want top half football, which again, I still think is un not unrealistic. Uh, probably two steps on the ladder rather than one. And I still think we're trying to, we need to take that Crystal Palace step. And again, we're getting ahead of ourselves. Um, oh, Mrs. Mitchell's in the comments saying Greg's home in a delightful mood. Does that mean he's joining us or not? I don't know if I want him to now. Um, the invitation's still there to him till about half eight, I said. Um, yeah, I think Nuno would stay um, and I think he's done a good job so far. I think performances have been better than results. Um, so yeah, I'd hope he would stay. The question I was going to throw back at you is, would we buy another striker who's a 90-minute man or would we place our faith in Tyro next season? If we manage to keep Tyro in the championship, he'll he'll have faith placed upon him. Is he cut out for a 46-game season with midweek fixtures pretty much the norm for a big <laughs> chunk of that? No, he's not. He's, he's... What about the Premier League thing? Assuming um, we stay up. Yeah, if we if we if we if we stayed up, then then yeah, a fully fit Tyro is is the plan, isn't it? But it's it's clearly not a a base fitness, you know, an ability to to run a forty minute ten k or whatever Premier League football is owned for. There's there's some kind of um, injury management, body management issue there. If it's the the hip, some kind of soft tissue injury that's flaring, recurring, and there's there's obviously some reason why he's never looked. Uh, entirely comfortable being a 90-minute man, and yet he can physically dominate his opponents, opposing centre-halves quite considerably throughout 45, 60-minute spells. So, yeah, I'm, I'm sold on Tywo. I look at some of the technical goals he scored, West Ham, Arsenal, numerous examples now, and just wish he was permanently available to us and I was convinced in and around the new year after the Newcastle game and just after that Chris Wood was the, the perfect backup to come on and continue to give a, a, a tired centre-half uh, a hard time so Origi's been better the last few weeks but I still wouldn't bet against him being shipped out and is looking for a third option who is a different profile of player um, to, to those two who is perhaps more of a uh, a runner from deep can play off a nine, um, can anticipate second balls, uh, maybe more of a one one touch finisher that comes alive in the box. So yeah, I think a striker will be on the shopping list, but I don't think it'll be the expensive time. Yeah, I think the next step in our evolution is to find our Ollie Watkins and our version of Tony, and I hope it is Taiwo uh, if he can just stay here, or it's Taiwo in a twenty minute sub. Right, uh, just quickly before we introduce our company, uh, thank you very much to Mark Atkin Barrett for becoming a member and uh, Channel LJS TV. Okay, very good. I appreciate the support very much. Joining us fresh from, oh, I say fresh, fresh from a long train journey back from Milan, because that's what you do to go and see your favourite band. You go to Milan. Is Greg Mitchell. How are you? Good, yeah. Pretty much on time as well. So, how's your day? Hey, how, how many air miles have you got? Because you, you live this like this <laughs> the lifestyle of an international jet setter, and I get pinged all the time for corporate invites and all the rest of it. But <laughs> Mitchell's out seven nights a week, holds down a full time job, walks his dog. I was going to say looks after his missus, but she'll probably come on the um, comments. She's in, in the comments. And, and <laughs> tell us, tell us otherwise. But this this man's never home. Lucky to have him. It was cheaper to go Milan than it was London. If you uh, need any travel advice, just let me know. I'm sure I can help. Who have you been with? I mean, we'll get to some football questions quickly. You've been on your own? <laughs> no, no. Around? I went with my uh, brother-in-law who lives in Chester and his mate. They're uh, big fans of the Idols. So it was brilliant. So much better than British gigs. Cannot recommend it enough. Now he sounds like the kid off the fast show, doesn't he? Aren't the Idols brilliant? <laughs> <laughs> You're getting some stick for going to Kettering rather than Manchester on the train. Yeah, the I don't hour. believe that. That's vicious that rumours. Well, it kind of <laughs> it, partly true. 
Oh dear. Right, you come back for a good question that's going to throw you right into the... You won't have time to think, Greg. You're going to have to deliver straight away. I'll put it uh, up around... Uh, it's from Chris Haynes. Uh, I've seen this has been doing the rounds on Twitter about player of the season and that kind of stuff. So, for each of us, we'll all do this. Player of the season, signing of the season, worst signing of the season, most improved player and honest final day league position. Do feel free to drop your answers in the comments as well. Interesting to see what people think. Uh, Greg, I'll give you thinking time. Don't worry. Uh, Temps, you go first for player of the season. Player of the season will be Tyro Awanyi off the back of the goals he's going to score between now and then to fire us. Three points clear of Luton and into to 17th place, which is my answer to the to the fourth question. Um, what about best, right now, player of the season? Player of the season, doing right it, now, we'll, do, we'll do it as if we're doing it right now. I mean, in pure in, in goal contribution terms, you can make a statistical case for Alanga, but he's he's perhaps been a little bit too too wasteful to be considered uh, a form player. Marillo's got a shout because he's been such a, a left field surprise. Got picked. We thought he was going to be at left pack, and he's he's just proved to be a, uh, a ready made Premier League footballer. One or two rough edges, but but what a talent! Can I see past those two? Probably not. I'm going to have to. I'm going to have to say Marillo's been the the, the standout player of the season for me. So far, worst signing. I mean, look, I hate saying it. It has to be Matt Turner. We thought he was going to be number one. He hasn't been. And we've been forced to go out and trade for a keeper in a January window, having signed two in the summer. So, yeah, look, he might redeem himself on the um, Footballer's Wife show on Amazon with some uh, killer lines or whatever. But, yeah, disappointed there because I was, I was hoping he was going to be more than he is. Uh, most improved player. These are tough, eh? Um, Do you want me to go? I've got. A, I've got. Go on, dive in on that. Uh, Nico Williams for me would be most improved player, just in terms of defensive strides made and consistency of performance. I would. I would say Nico. I agree. Do you know? Because I'm organised, Matt. I've got a list. <laughs> You've got these. a list. Just, all right, we'll come yeah. back yeah. to you. Just let attempts, just let attempts say <laughs> finals A league position then, and then we'll come back to you. Seventeenth, and I, I, the reason for that is I think we are going to get um, pinged probably in that three to five point um, tariff, if you like. So it, it, it'll be tight. And we've been through a period of games now where we see how unforgiving and how, how brutal the, the, the Premier League is. So, yeah, I think we're going to finish 17th. I think we'll be five to six points clear of Luton by that point. There'll be no stress on the final day. But survival off the back of some of the indifferent form and the PRFP challenge we, we've had is success for me. Uh, go on then, Greg. What's your list? And then I'll go. I'll go next. Um, Emma actually sent me this yesterday. She sent it me and Emily, and all three of us have different uh, answers. So I got Player of the Season Gibbs White. I think he's just going to keep coming on stronger and stronger. Uh, young player Ed Murillo. Most improved, I agree. Nico. He's just been fantastic. Uh, sorry, someone's just jumped up on the computer. Um, here, don't worry. Uh, goal of the season, Woods against Newcastle. Even the list I sent you. <laughs> it's not even it's a question, Greg. I'm just going off mine yesterday. Do you want me to continue? Please do. Yeah, please do. <laughs> Win of the season's Newcastle away. Uh, loss of the steward of the year in a minute is going to be so so far down this list. <laughs> loss of the season's <laughs> Liverpool and signing of the season, which I loved the question, uh, Murillo. Very good. Well, I say very good. It was not even the list that was supposed <laughs> to answer. This is how it's going to be. <laughs> right, I'll do this list that Chris Haynes submitted. Uh, player of the season, it says so far, so I'll say, um, you know, I was going to say Murillo, but I think he does make does make mistakes. You just get caught in the glitz. I think he's going to be brilliant and has been intermittently brilliant. Um, no, I do think it's been Murillo, actually. Uh, some of his performances, like Arsenal at home, even though we lost the game, I thought he was great. And then the game after um, Villa as well. And Bournemouth away, I thought he was great. Uh, best sign of the season, by that logic, is Murillo. But I'll say Dominguez, just to throw some variety into it. I think he's been really good apart from that Fulham disaster. Um, and What about uh, Matt B's shout of Santos in worst player? Forgot about him. Worst sign, yeah. I think, yeah. 
I, that was kind of most seen significant, wasn't it? I think you have to say Turner, really. I, I, it's a harsh question, but we'll, we'll, I'll answer it. Because if you look at the numbers, him and Vlakodimos are probably one of the big reasons we're right down there. The other thing I was going to say, though, is there's always a way back for players. I don't know in Turner's case specifically, because I feel like he's got a ceiling and we've seen it. But like Chris Wood has shown that if you do badly, you can still turn it around. And there's probably players that we're looking at now who we think have been disappointing. Like Sangare, I guess, is the prime example. He could really come through for us. There's probably some people who would drop Sangare's name in there thus far as a worse signing. Uh, most improved player, I've said, Nico. And I agree with Tam, 17th. And then hopefully the point of penalty isn't too much because I think we'll finish six to eight points ahead of Luton, I hope. It might be wishful mm. thinking. If we beat them, certainly. Um, God, if we lose to them, it probably changes that a lot. But I, I just look at their squad and think they're doing so well. If they can yeah. keep it up and keep nicking results, then fair play to them. But I just do just think we'll that's where we'll we'll finish uh, roughly. It'll right. be interesting to ask, other than the last question, because we'll already know it, but it'll be interesting to ask that at the end of the season, because I think after the last three games, if Origi keeps going the way he is going, there'll be a shout for him to be most improved as well, because he was so disappointing. He was almost in that other category, and now he just keeps coming on. So if that continues, he should be right up there. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Speaking of Matt Dean, um, my wife said the other day, there's so many Matt Davises. Uh, I don't know if this is Davis, as me assuming. But um, yeah, thank you very much for becoming uh, a channel member. Uh, very kind of you and appreciate uh, everyone who's signed up for that. You've just joined uh, so... your own channel to inflate the numbers there, haven't you? We know, we know what you're doing. <laughs> right, I won't put this question up because it's quite long. Uh, it's a question from Paul Nunes around VAR, which I wasn't going to take. I thought we'll move on from it. But there's a couple of interesting takes I've not actually heard before. Uh, so Paul Nunes asks... Should VAR be operated by a team of independent specialist officials, officials who have nothing to do with on-field official, officials? And could you incorporate ex-players into that? I thought that was quite an interesting one, um, Greg, that you just it becomes a specialist position and you're not an on-field ref and you're just a VAR. Or, or are you yeah. just completely dead against it? Man? No, well, I'm dead against it, but it's never going to leave us, is it? It's here. We'd be absolutely naive to believe that we're going to protest and get rid of it because it's just not going to happen it's here to stay it's good for the tv and that's the way it is the only thing we can do is try and make it better now like you say Tierney is is like punishment is being put in charge of pretty much the final decision on things at the weekend it's crazy he shouldn't be anywhere near anything to do with decisions for this weekend you know he should be out of it so yeah an independent you know, specific VAR people rather than referees, current referees and this, that, the other, because that isn't working. It might be a, a good option and I'm sure something that the powers that be wouldn't listen to. So <laughs> it's a great idea, but nothing will change to, to benefit us, I'm certain. It's just an absolute car crash and it will continue to be that way. Uh, I'll put the second part of the question to you, Temps, because uh, it's also interesting as well. Uh, Paul suggests or asks... Should referee linesmen and VAR officials operate in the same team, so the same unit, so they always work together and it creates a degree of consistency in their own group rather than mismatch week in, week out? No, you, you are arguing both against against the middle, aren't you? If we had ex-pros in the VAR room and they were making similar mistakes or independence, we'd be calling for the qualified match referees who've had years of experience in the Premier League, know the rules, know the nuances and train full-time to be doing the VAR. Similarly, if we had the same set of four running around officiating together, we, we'd villainise them in the same way we do individual referees and call for them not to be matey, to be set, uh, set apart, to challenge each other and just to produce the best performance that they, they can. So all, all we're trying to do is, all we're suggesting here is that we spin the wheel. But the reality of what would happen in that scenario is that we'd, we'd call for the opposite of that because the problems wouldn't get up, go away. If it was an ex-player, an independent or an, an established experienced Premier League ref in that VAR room, circumstances are going to present themselves where one team's unhappy, one team's delighted, one team's nicked one, one team's got away with got away with one. I I don't like VAR any more than the next man, but these aren't real solutions. These are just putting different people in the chair to make the same mistake. 
Yeah, I'd agree with that. I think they're interesting questions, but I think it all comes down to misusing technology and just having better people using it uh, at the end of the day. Um, it's a quick word for our sponsors as ever before we take another question. Trent Navigation, everyone knows that by now. But you can get down there on Friday night uh, for the boxing. It is called Knockout Chaos at the Trent Navigation Big Shed this Friday as Anthony Joshua takes on Francis Ngannou in a blockbuster pay-per-view heavyweight showdown in Saudi Arabia. I assume Fletcher's out there commentating on that fresh from doing the Champions League. So, uh, yeah, thank you very much to the NAV for all their support and do go and enjoy some uh, top quality boxing on your Friday night. Right, back to the questions. Uh, bear with me one second. It was a question from Simon Morgan, I think was the name. Uh, uh, probably more for, actually, I think it's for Temps, but Greg could answer it as well. When do you think season card renewals will happen and do you expect a huge price rise? I see um, Temps Spurs, I think, have put, put theirs out today and a pretty hefty rise. I think it was eight, 6 to 8%, if I'm correct. Uh, we, we, I think we're in season card time now. Are you ex this is a notional question. Are you expecting a price rise or not? Yeah, I'm expecting a price rise because if if, if you don't, uh, the, the club will lose revenue in in, in real terms. Um, none of us perhaps feel particularly um, richer, despite Jeremy Hunt giving his two percent back today. Um, but yeah, it will happen. I I also would expect because I've seen this argument before with, with relegation. We hold the prices because you're getting X games instead of you're getting 23 games instead of 20. So, what would I like to happen for Premier League football to remain affordable? What am I seeing happen? A sold out city ground every week where you could um, increase prices by by 10 percent and and still fill the place. So, yeah, don't envy those people making those decisions. But I, I would suspect there'll be a price rise uh, price rise in the range of five five to six percent. Yeah, I imagine so. It's supply and demand, isn't it? If we can sell out an FA Cup tie that's on TV against Man United, who we played eight times in the last season or whatever it is, then the interest is there. Any thoughts on season tickets, Greg, before we move on? Uh, yeah, I think we should freeze them. That's... <laughs> no, um, there's always going to be a slight rise, isn't there? You'd hope they'd not be. You'd hope we get rewarded for our loyalty and fill in the ground every week and this, that, the other, but... It's the world we live in, unfortunately, isn't it? The one thing I'd love to see is, however it may happen, just somehow opening up a small part of the, the away membership scheme somehow just to get some different people being able to go to games because I know how tough it is for, for most people to try and get a ticket. So if there was a way to reward loyalty but also give a small amount to, to season card holders, even if it was like 100 a game or something then that'd be a good thing but bit of rotation mate ball. get get the Mitchells yeah. out bit of rotation no I'm here to stay unfortunately I've got my <laughs> got my spot <laughs> no, champagne really socialist somewhere. Greg Mitchell <laughs> says change the policy as long as I keep my tickets hey I'm I'll be down Brighton on Sunday I could do with a weekend of nothing but I'll be there We've not really discussed away membership. I see it all the time on Twitter. I don't really understand it. So probably we something we should do do more and pick that up later. A uh, question from Philip Mills uh, on YouTube. Uh, with 11 games to go, six home, five away, I'm curious how Mark, substitute Greg, and Temps would approach team selection regarding centre-halves and midfield pairings. Uh, we've seen different ones uh, basically succeed and fail. I mean, if you were picking one tomorrow, Greg, for Brighton, what would it be? Centre defence and central midfield. Um, Felipe and Murillo centre defence. I think that's starting to show it's uh, it's working. It should have been a clean sheet on Saturday, obviously, if we hadn't been completely. That was on with Armadelli, though. Oh, at the end, it was it. No, it was on with Armadelli and Murillo against Liverpool. Sorry, yeah, it's been a long day in the travel. <laughs> <laughs> uh, midfield, I. I Again, I know I've got some stick in the comments off my mate Dansgate, but I'd have uh, I'd have um, Arigi behind the the front guy again, and I really like seeing him at the minute. So uh, obviously Gibbs White's playing; he's a he's a staple part, and I'll um, I'll be uh, campaigning to see some Rainer at some point. But the only way we see him is if we're in a comfortable position in the game and get him some minutes because. Again, it's just a strange one, isn't it? So I'd love to see him get some minutes soon because he is going to be a, and is a top quality player. I will say before I throw it to Temps, um, 
I mean, at the moment, it would be Amabama, Dali and Murillo, but I think it could change game by game based on opponents and based on performance. It's Murillo, it's still Murillo and A and other, isn't it? It could be Felipe. Willy Bolly could come in and have a stormer, and then we're saying, oh, we've got Willy Bolly. So we'll see. I really hope it's Amabama, Dali emerges uh, with consistent performances and we get consistent results, and then we could just run with them and go into next season, hopefully. That's kind of my dream scenario. And then central midfield, I really hope it's Sangare and Dominguez because it means Sangare's played well. And if he's played well, I think we're getting results. So um, hopefully it's that. Uh, and then the front four picks itself, hopefully. Rain is going to, it looks like Rain is going to go down as some of this phantom weird signing that's just some odd business. But you can see the merits at the time. And I do hope he has the roles play in the final weeks of the season. And I really hope Origi has a roles play because he's just showing signs. I'm still not convinced. <laughs> But if he is an option who can score three or four goals before the end of the campaign, that'd be brilliant. Temps, what are you thinking? Yeah, you, I mean, you picked my ears up there with that. Origi, Sangare, Omar Bamadeli. Maintaining their place in the side through form can only be a good thing for all of us because they've showed flashes, but but ultimately inconsistency and, and mistakes in, in key areas of the pitch. So I take the logic. If those three are playing well and are in, that's significant added value from within the squad and we, we, we could be a side transformed. There's a few inked in. I think that the best of Dominguez is, is great. Danilo vies with him, doesn't he, because of his dynamism and his ability to, to break out and do a bit of everything when he's, when he's in form. So don't, don't mind him as an option. Um, and he could end up having far more minutes than, than Sangari if he carries on in, in the vein that he's in at the minute. Take Greg's point about Felipe. Again, the, the, the best of him is, is, is very assured, uh, provides a, a calmness and, and leadership at the back and a, you know, a, a, bit of, a bit of steel as well, more than willing to, to put, his, put his foot in. Um, yeah, crucial, crucial selections there. And I, I hope that we, we do see an emergence of, of form. Bolly's an interesting one, you know. He, he's done very little wrong this season. Injured at the wrong time, Afcon at the wrong time. Uh, near Carte, seemingly uh, Nuno w wanted to find a way to accommodate him, had that failed experiment uh, at left back, but it hasn't done him any favours and he's found himself down the pecking order at, at centre-half, possibly off the back of that, as well as all the, the notes we've made in the past about his um, his aerial performance. So, yeah, there's, there's options there. I've sat on the fence a little bit, but, yeah, that, that Sangare... Dominguez, Murillo, an inform form Omobamadeli or a Felipe when he's 95 plus percent fit feels like good foundations. Uh, how do we feel, the question from Marte, about MGW this season? It's been, it's been a weird season for him, I think. What do you think, Greg? And I'll go right I, I, I know he gets so much stick because out of the, the amount of possession we do get, is the guy on the ball probably more than anyone so he's going to make a few more mistakes and lose the ball a few more times than everyone else but I've had this argument previously that he's probably the most influential player on the pitch for us and if he doesn't play we lose a lot of our chances and I know you know he's taking the corners and they're not really doing anything at the minute some of them are good but for me he's still probably our most influential and best player this season so He's, he's getting better. He's better on last season. And I know I get accused of trying to sell a players, but if he continues the way he is continuing, he will he will go up the league, whether with us or with someone else. I think his form, excuse me, since Nuno came in, is, I think he's been really solid, like a consistent 7 out of 10 guy. I think the criticism or the, the challenge is, can he be a match winner? And he did it against Man United and was really good. Don't think he's had too many outstanding performances since then. He's just been really steady, and he's you know Rain has not threatened his place at all, which I was kind of hoping he would. Um, but I think he's done fine. I just think there's another gear, which is with the gear that elevates him into England contention, which we sort of briefly saw last season. Um, at the start of the season, he was a bit ropey, but he played all that under twenty one stuff. He'd not had a break. Um, his missus was pregnant, all that kind of stuff that goes into the stuff that we don't see. So, yeah, I've been happy with his form. I just hope there's another another level to it. And if he finds it, then I don't think we've got any worries about staying up because he'll be a match winner. What about you, Temps? 
I want to find a way to get him on the ball more. So we had a challenge at the start of the season where he was often starting wide. Um, he had the calf problems in the back, back end of, of, of last year and his, his form was extremely inconsistent. We've given him assurance now that week after week after week, he's going to start in, in the 10 spot. He's going to have really active runners out wide. He's generally going to have Taiwo or, or, or Woody in front of him. And there's going to be two defensively minded players anchoring the midfield that are going to give him that freedom to, to cheat a bit and hold his position in the in the final third. But in, in not dropping back and, and being um, first point of attack, playing like a distributor quarterback, he's having less possession. So I don't know, it just, just seems to be slightly more pressure on him when he, he does get the ball and he's guilty of forcing it at times because we can all see his ability, what he can do, some of the balls he's played, some of the, some of the dribbles, how comfortable he is in, in tight spaces. He's in the right position in the team. We've taken away some defensive responsibility, given him that elevated position, told him, you're in here week after week after week. How do we generate possession for him in the final third? That's the key to him being a, uh, the key player, the playmaker in this side, or just being one of three or four that, that might find that spot. Mm, yeah, so um, interesting one from Black Finch. Have we seen his ceiling? Oh, I don't no, think no, no, uh, no. I think there's more to come. I think it's just unlocking it uh, and, it, uh, you know, another season of stability or stability, another season of the Premier League, another season with better players around him. I mean, imagine if Elanga kicks on to another gear next year and how Gibbs White could find him. And we've seen these shoots of what Hudson Adoy can do of late, and I think he'll be really good. And a fully fit Taiwo running in front of him to find, I think, yeah, I think there's much more to come from him. And also, I don't think his set piece is that bad. I think they were bad. I don't think he, he he's I think he's hitting them where he's been told to. I think the problem is that he's always hitting them in the same place, and there doesn't seem to be any variety to them. At least on Saturday, we tried that uh, ball where he knocked it uh, through for Elanga uh, rather than putting it in the box, but Elanga ran offside because that's you know, what you can do sometimes. And we even we even took a short corner at one point with Callum Hudson Adore taking it off him. So that I think that's more my gripe. Um, around set pieces. But yeah, he's got a long way to go to get into the England squad when you look at, you know, the talent that's in there, like with Phil Foden and Bellingham now amongst the world's best players and Madison as their backup. So uh, if he can get near that level, then he'll be great for us. And I think he can play a deeper midfield role as well, uh, which we haven't really um, touched on. Uh, there was a quick question. Um, I'll throw this one at you, Temps, because um, I don't really know the answer. Oliver, who's a member, Oliver Hale Nolly is his YouTube name. I can't remember his real name, sorry. Do you think Forest Women would grow their audience with regular matches at the City Ground? You run events at big venues. um, It was interesting seeing Arsenal and Spurs were sold out at the weekend uh, and the women's games making progress. If we see more games at the City Ground, will it it kick on attendance-wise? No, it won't be 30,000 necessarily, but it can be more, can't it? I'm working on the bid this week to uh, to, to keep the, the women's professional team at Trent Bridge until 2028. So, yeah, yeah, done an awful lot of research recently about where women's sports are and where it's going. I know having from having spoken to uh, the, the folk at Forest, they're desperate for their women to establish themselves as a f- full-time team, um, which would be a, a massive line in the sand. They're just finding themselves at the minute... Uh, a bit a bit wanting when they play against full-time teams in the cup when they play against teams with far superior budgets so it's it's not all about um necessarily the the, the level that you're at but you, you have to be consistently winning games and competing if if you're if you're going to put across an elite proposition for, for women's sport there's a reason why the clamor for tickets at Wimbledon is pretty much equal for the the, the men's and women's competition forest aren't quite there yet but they'll get there. It needs to be resourced. You need to invest in this. It's, it's definitely a case that, you know, that the, the riches don't follow, the, the competition success doesn't follow unless you take a punt and resource your team at, at some point, as we saw with Notts County in their kind of <clears throat> failed experiment six or seven years ago. So they're, they're being patient. They're doing it the right way. They, they do market it. You know, I get the emails about these games. Um, they, they do give them some access to the to the city ground but you you can't play 60 games a year on that pitch they have to have a, a base elsewhere if Forest are going to maintain the surface they need for the premier league so yes of course there's a positive impact when they they play at the city ground but it's going to take a, 
a period of time to establish them and to get anywhere near a, a crowd of 10,000 plus. Uh, we've got two pre-submitted questions left uh, on the list here. So if anyone's got any uh, <clears throat> in the live chat they want to drop in, I can try and rattle through a few more in a bit of a, a lightning round in the final uh, 10 minutes or so. Uh, Greg Orr makes a point about Cole Palmer as well, being in that, that shake-up for Gibbs White's position. And he's having a, a fantastic season, certainly. So, yeah, ever more competition. Um, Sean Jones, 6695, asks... I'm feeling really positive, even with a potential six-point deduction. The bottom two are as poor as it gets, and Luton is so porous at the back. There seems to be a good vibe within the team, fewer mistakes, and a really impressive improvement regarding the goalkeeper. Hopefully, with more players back off the treatment table and in the squad, and the next two opponents have midweek matches, uh, and the owners desperate desperate to renovate the stadium. It all feels bright for the future. Am I mad? How are you? Oh, I'm asking the wrong person. How are you feeling about the future, Greg? That sounds like something I'd write. Yeah. Why not? It's so much nicer and calmer and better to, to think like that. Like, why shouldn't we be confident about the future? We've got an owner that that's absolutely desperate to get us up the league. He's clearly passionate, as we saw at the weekend. Uh, we just need a little bit more luck going our way to get these points on the board that we're going to need. And, you know, we've all been talking for so long about this point deduction. It feels like it's already happened when, you know, it might, it might get zero. We might, you just don't know, do you? But we are better than two of those three, certainly. Then it's between what? Us, Everton, Luton. Luton aren't looking that great. We, it seems fashionable to talk about the fact that um, oh, they're, they're really battling. and Yeah, but they're still losing, aren't they? You know, we can we can pick up a lot more points. And if we get through this season and we stay in this league, it'll be players like Gibbs White who will benefit because, again, we're going to push on and get more, more of the ball and be more competitive next season. And we will find ways to spend money in the summer because that's what the owner wants to do. And it's like therapy. It, Carry on, mate. It's like yeah, therapy. Okay. But it, it is like we've spent so many months now with this like financial fair play cloud over us that you start to believe it where nothing's happened. So continue as we are. Continue with that nice gap between us and the, the bottom three as it is and keep getting away from them because we are much better than those teams. If we went down, it'd be because of something else not the way not how good we are this season you know so just keep picking up points and Brighton's a perfect chance at the weekend to really give it and I do think we're gonna we're gonna go there with a little bit more fire in us because of what happened at the weekend and if we don't use what happened last weekend as, as something to really get us going then we've missed a trick yeah I mean I think the short term hurdle is can we stay up this season and I think we can Yes, and then the crucial. next big question is, can we stay up the next season? Because the, we won't be afforded... I can't see if the team's as bad as Sheffield United and Burnley coming up. I mean, Ipswich are doing great, and I'm sure they'd struggle. But if Leicester come up, they've got some weird financial stuff going on around FFP uh, statements coming out today. But let's assume they come up if we're on zero points. They'll be better. Leeds will be better. And if it's Southampton, they'll be better than the three we've seen. So can we stay up again next season? And then every team, every season we stay in the Premier League, it's just another building block. Uh, you only have a one bad season away, of course. But I, I feel like there's the building, you know, the building blocks and the foundations of a good team. Uh, if we can retain the right, you know, decent players and just add add around them and not kind of go crazy in the market and just add some quality around them because the foundations are there. So I'm optimistic for the future. Um, in the short term and then the medium term if we can stay up next season as well but obviously get this season out of the way first how are you feeling Temps? yeah i mean not not quite as um uh what's what's the word yeah blindly Blind optimistic is greg mitchell <laughs> <laughs> i just i know on the um the equivalent luton podcast there'll be a, a greg type personality that just has this endearing beaming positivity that everything's going to be all right yeah but that'll be false soap over there yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's what he says about you that's what luton's greg says about you he's like yeah Forrest's gonna get 15 points deducted and sangore's not in form and turner's gonna come back in goal but um yeah yeah i i, I do think we're going to improve from this point but this this season's a blip this this season will be far more disappointing than last season when there was no expectation beyond trying our best to stay up 
at one stage almost being resigned to, to going down, but grateful for the adventure and, and all the rest of it. We've, we've elevated our perception of, of, of where, we, where we should be. And Greg's slightly more guilty than that than, than most. We love him for it. If you kick on by six points a year um, for, for three seasons, you've done something truly exceptional. Matt's exactly right. We're looking at two of the worst Premier League sides of all time in the shootout this year. To give Greg some credit, the, the counter-argument to Luton, I think, have taken one point from sixes. They had a couple of, couple of lucky results, which gave them false hope, which forced me to make a bet with Darren Fletcher that I'm going to lose and, and all the rest of it. And they really haven't got too much, too much going on. So back to matters at home, what will happen? 17th place this year then I do believe we'll kick on. I think every manager is going to be better for having had a, a pre-season prepared in their own way, not coming in on a, on a firefighting mission, just being able to own something from, from the start and influence the personnel that are going to deliver the, the results for them. So my prediction is two more seasons of Nuno after this, in which we kick on in both years and survival, which is all that matters for, for me from this point in this season at the expense of Luton. Uh, very good. Right, last shout for questions. Uh, we'll go through a few people asking when we find out about uh, the FFP results. We can appeal them in mid-April, can't we? I don't know when we find out, actually. I'll have to Google that because it could rumble on until the end of the season. So uh, I don't want to give the, a false answer unless either of you chaps know the actual answer before we move on. No. Nope. Good. <laughs> right, last question on the list and then I'll see if we can take a couple more quickly before we depart. Question from James Mercer. It's normal in football to give extra support to homegrown players, especially local lads. Why are we different? Yates and Wall are great examples. Our squad's been inconsistent, made mistakes, but fans seem far less forgiving of those two and set the bar for positivity higher than the other players. It's not encouraging for younger players. Um, uh, Temps, you go first. Do you accept the premise of the question, first of all? And if so, why? Yates and who? Joe Warren were listed as examples, but generally, yeah, why are we more critical of uh, homegrown players than we are of other ones? Um, well, less critical, right? Less critical for, for me. He's saying, well, James is saying we're more critical of the players like Yates and Warren and um, less forgiving of errors by them. No, I, I, I do, I, I do disagree with that. I think. We, we come from a, a position where, as, as Forest fans, we like that story of those that have come through the academy, aspired to be there, have done well for us over a period of time. And specifically in recent history, we associate with that championship season and winning a game of football at Wembley, which we hadn't done for a, for a long, long time. So I feel the opposite of that. I think we've, well, I, I've certainly made a case for, um, for, for players, possibly for, for slightly longer than, than, than others would. But... My, my own perspective is I like that. I, I do forgive it. I think it's important. I see behind the scenes at my place what it what it means for those that are truly connected to a club do off the pitch, welcoming players, integrating them, making them know how things tip, how things work, who's who, how they should be. So yeah, not not for me. I'm on the I'm on the other side of that coin altogether. Uh, let's put this comment up uh, as Dan says the more professional broadcasting operation of Radio Nottingham say we'll find out our podcast uh, our penalty excuse me on the 15th of March the day before we play Luton Christ okay that could be a real kick in the teeth couldn't it so uh, yeah a bridge to cross later perhaps <coughs> um, yeah I gave this question some thought I, I don't really accept the premise like Temps I think what I think happens is narratives form around players and we're probably all guilty of it ourselves included and players who come through the academy they don't get that kind of fresh start of a transfer so we form an opinion of them and it's hard for them to change it so if they have a bad run of form people just become convinced they're rubbish when i don't think they are and i think joe Warrell was a case of that and yates has been a case of that i said on monday's podcast there seems to be a school of thought around him amongst a group of fans that if he plays below anything below a 7 out of 10, it's viewed as a 3 out of 10. And I think that became the case with Joe. But that can be the case with any player. I think if they've been here long enough, uh, like I said earlier, I think there's always a way back for players. So I think we are critical of them, but we're critical of every player. Um, I just kind of think we all need to be more open to changing our opinion of players, like Nico's done it this season. Uh, and uh, sometimes we're a bit 
close closing our opinions of players, I would say. But I'm a big backer of Ryan Yates, and I think he's generally done really well this season. Uh, and if Joe comes back, he's probably got more of a challenge to prove he can play consistently in the Premier League. He's just had he's had good games and he's had bad games, and probably not enough. Uh, you know, probably in the middle somewhere. I would say. What's your take on it, Greg? Everyone's a- brilliant. I, no, I, I just think it's a complete mix of fans, isn't it? I've always got the the homegrown players back more than any because you're proud of them because we've had such a long run of always producing talent. And you, as a football fan, we saw it uh, in the cup. Who came on for us? Joe Gardner. Gardner came on. The reception he got for making the most simplest tackle as well and the cluff stander up on the feet. And, like, don't tell me we don't support our own because we absolutely do. But then there's others that think Yates shouldn't be in the team and they stick with that opinion. And it's just when you've got 30,000 football fans, there's going to be so many different opinions. But I think on the whole, Forest fans have always supported their own more than more than a... £20 million pound signing that just comes walking through the door. I think we've always got our, our own back more than that. But, yeah, there's always going to be a difference, isn't there? I hate to sit on the fence on that one. Yeah, true. Someone's asking if it's a boarded-up radio, uh, win, board window, but it's a radiator. It's not a boarded-up window. <laughs> <laughs> the radiator, my message. Yeah, yeah, I know what he means. It's the artwork, isn't it? Where? This? The uh, artwork behind it looks like... A... No, it looks really nice. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, well, good job. My wife never watches this. So. <laughs> um, yeah, there's interesting around comments around this is in debates around individual players and what they bring to the team, isn't it? About people saying Yates fancies man of the match, even though he's given fouls away. It's That's opinion. a question of how much yeah. how much value players bring, isn't it? I think he brings value, and sometimes he does give too many fouls away. Um, but generally, I think he does well. What was the game where he gave loads of fouls away recently at home? I can't remember what it was. Might have been Arsenal or something like that. But, yeah, it's a wider debate, certainly. Uh, Right, let's rattle through any other questions, if there are any. I've said that. I don't know if any have actually dropped in. There were some earlier. Uh, There was one about how many points we get against certain teams I saw. Hang on a sec. Oh, how many points will be enough, do you think, just while we're there? Someone's asking that. How many points to stay up, Greg? It, again, it depends on points deduction, but there was the, the super, supercomputer coming out saying it'll be the least amount of points ever needed in the Premier League, wasn't it? Like It could be as low as something like 33, which is mm. just because two of the three have absolutely bottomed out, haven't they? Um, so, yeah, I think it'll be 35 at most needed to stay up. And after a points deduction? You think? I don't think we're going to get a points deduction, and that is just my personal view. I don't think we'll get one this year, we'll say, but I don't think we'll get one. What about you, Temps? Disagree, sadly. I think we will get a points deduction. I think by the very fact that we've complied, thrown the books open, lent into it, rather than tried to uh, conceal in the in, in the manner and confused in the manner that Everton did. The tariff will be somewhere in the region of three to five points. I think we are on course, therefore, to get somewhere in the region of 38 to 42 points. And I'd struggle to see Luton getting past 34. So, yeah, that tells you how tight it is if we're at the top end of that, that tariff. Um, Alan's whacked 40 points in the comments. There was a good good bit of analysis on Sky Sports recently. Very rarely has the trapdoor been as, as high as, as 40 points. It's actually generally far closer to, to mid-30s. And as, as Greg said, could be as low as 33. So I'm going to club up a little bit and say Luton are going to set a target of 34 points. And we need to be beyond that figure after deduction. Yeah, I'm going to say... 40 minus 6, which would put us on 34. And then if we get 40 points and then we get 34, I'm going to assume we got better goal difference than, than them, so we'd stay up on goal difference. Uh, that would mean we need uh, 16 more points. It's, uh, 16 points from 11 games. It's, it's actually quite steep, but I think we can do it. I mean, oh, God, I hope we can do it. We sat here saying we're definitely going to stay up. I think uh, we've got enough fixtures to do it. It sort of leads into this question because we've got – 
a lot of games against teams in the bottom half who we haven't actually done that well against this season, but they're going to decide our fate, really, not the Liverpool games, um, which is we, we could have done with that point. How many game, How many points will we get from games against Luton, Sheffield United, Burnley and Everton? All the way, Greg Mitchell. Or do you want to top it up? Go on, Temps. Oh, so Seven. I'll go for it. Seven. Seven. Okay. Um, one, four... Seven, eight. No, seven. Seven. Okay, I think we'll draw with Luton, beat Sheffield United and Burnley, and lose to Everton. That's seven points. Oh, gosh. Is that yeah, just copy my answer if you want, Matt. Don't, don't feel the need to, to necessarily... Well, you didn't break it down, did you? I'll, uh, I'll go nine points, obviously. <laughs> oh, but well. the one that will really because annoy of it, me Because is, of a dodgy VAR decision in the, in the fourth game, be, though, Greg. It'll be something stupid like <laughs> Sheffield United will be the only... They'll get three more points this season and it'll be against us because they're such blooming... I don't like them and it'll be that one. But we'll get we'll get nine points out of those four. Ben Osborne, winner. That'll keep us up. If we were to get seven and they were the next run of games, that would be 31 points and 31 games, which would give us... That would put us on track uh, to stay up, hopefully. So, uh, oh, God. Yeah, it's when you when you talk about it like this, you realise how close it's going to be. Um yeah. Because we've blown so many points in so many other games, I don't count Liverpool in that. But there's so when we get to the end of the season, there's gonna be so many games we look back on and with regret of like bloody Brentford away and West Ham away and Brighton at home, and I'm probably forgetting loads more where we could have done and should have done that little bit better that makes a difference. Uh, what are people saying? Twelve, ten, uh, four wins and four draws needed, eight points. Uh, we'll beat Palace and Fulham at home as well. And we've got Wolves at home as well, haven't we, Greg? So mm. there's, there, there should be fixtures there, you would hope. Brighton's a massive chance. They're tired. They're losing games and they're excited about the game. When is it? What day is it? Tomorrow night. They're not even thinking what, about us what yet. What day is it? <laughs> <laughs> it's what it's Where am to. I? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think Brighton's a big opportunity. Well, I think we it is. Can go it's a massive opportunity, and we're wounded. That's going to be our big thing. We're going down there. Peed um, up. Okay. Alex says, "Do the full running game by game." Uh, this uh, I, I'm going to say this is pointless because you know they never turn out how it, how it will. But let's do it quickly and just uh, tot up a consensus. I like uh, hearing Brighton, your workings. Brighton away. How many Three. points, Greg? Three. Okay. Tot these, uh, tot these up and we'll see how many we get to at the end. Right. Luton away. Note that down. Crystal Palace at home. Play along in the comments as well. Fulham at home. Tottenham away. Wolves away. I think someone's trying to break into my house, unless that's my wife. I'll just assume it's my wife, because otherwise, if I get battered over the head in the next few minutes, you'll know. Uh, Everton away. Man City at home. Sheffield United away. Chelsea at home. And Burnley away. I think in my head, well, amid panic that I've been broken into, I think I had 16 points there. I've got us to 39 there, uh, yeah. which is yeah, 15 points for me. So I've got 16 points. So Greg's got like 23. Uh, what I have got, you got, Greg? I've got 18. That will be okay. That's, so that not, keep us that's up, not unreasonable. It? That's more than doable. Look at the spread in the comments. Anything from 13 <laughs> to 20. Greg's cousin's been on. Audrey Brooks, 25. There she is. <laughs> My, my 16 took us to 40, which is the target. And Dan, that's winning the last three games. I mean, we can't need to go and win the last three games, can we? God, I really hope not. But the last three games are pretty winnable. Uh, was it Sheffield United away, Chelsea at home, Burnley away? Like, if we front up, then we could win. Bearing in uh, mind, I didn't give us any points for uh, Sheffield United away either, so it could be breaking. You got us winning at Spurs or something? Uh, no, I got us winning at the weekend, which makes a difference. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's... No points against Spurs. It's interesting. It shows how big the game is, or these games can be. You, you nick a result 
out of the blue, and it makes all the difference, doesn't it? Certainly. Right. Uh, that was a, a good hour covered. I think we've uh, gone through all the questions. If we missed any, then I do apologise. Um, but thanks for all your company, 400 people with us, uh, which is great. Greg, uh, any final words? Or are you just looking forward to going to sleep? I want to shower. Uh, do you know, coming back from the airport today, like even we flew back from Bergamo. And they had uh, Atalanta play there, and they had a little shop. I think Nottingham East Midlands Airport should get itself a little forest shop for all the for locals, for starters. And then just talking about pushing on, like flying into Manchester, there's a load of Villa fans there ready to fly out. I can't remember, are they, I can't remember where they are. Uh, there was Man City fans flying in, Liverpool fans flying out, ready to play in Europe. If we do push on, and I know we never we never thought we'd be in the Premier League, but it's getting easier and easier to get into Europe. I'm going to say, like, if we stay up this year, I think in the next five or six years, we'll be having those Thursday nights at least in airports all across. The <laughs> my mum just crashing the podcast. She's put my kids to bed. I'm sorry about her. <laughs> Uh, so I thought she was just going to sneak through Probably the gives a better and opinion. Like, walk, walk up to the camera, yeah. <laughs> Can you run those fixtures past her and just see how many points we're going to get? My mum's an optimist. She'll be up there with Greg, it's, I'd have thought. Look, we, well, we I just... know they're saying I've been drinking, I haven't. But um, we, five years ago, we'd never have thought we'd be sat here talking about a second season in the Premier League. It's something like 3% of teams don't stay in the Premier League longer than 10 years. If we're to push on, we're going to have to make it to 7th, 8th, ninth in the league, you know, eventually. And that's when you start having your Thursday nights and uh, imagine the ticket scrambles and arguments then. I just think so, it's yeah. funny that like, we, we just totted up a panicked, <laughs> desperate bid to stay in the Premier League and then Greg's next comment is about how we're going to be playing in Europe soon. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, well, it, I just I was very envious and very jealous of all those fans at Manchester Airport today, and the Villa fans had they'd been on it. They'd got the bucket hats and the cans of beer. <laughs> they looked like they were having the time of their life already. I know, so one of my friends why not dream them, a yeah. bit? Exactly, exactly. Temps, any final words before we go? I'll just address the questions about whether I've left home or not. Yeah, it is. It is my house. My mum's been around all day looking after the kids while I've been in London. So I mean, she'll get the message at some point and get out, get out a shot. Realise we've got a job to do here. Yeah, <laughs> yeah she's uh, just pottering around, just picking things just, up, just laying the kids' uniform out for, for tomorrow. <laughs> Her yeah. <in> abuse. <laughs> she'll, she'll just carry on if that's all right. She almost got a spot on this podcast at one stage. It was, it was she's going. Around. She's going now. So I've got to give her a hug and a kiss as well. Oh, so we'll let you go. We'll end it there. Uh, <laughs> Michael Temple, thank you very much. Greg Mitchell, thank you very much. Uh, when are we back? We're back on Friday. Well, there's a member stream tomorrow. If you want to consider being a, a member, then you could sign up for that, the top tier membership. Uh, that'd be great. But don't worry if you don't. I know time. But having just seen the budget today, we know times are very tough. Right. Uh, Mrs. Temple is famous. Yes. So we'll leave it there. Thanks for everyone's company. Back on Friday. Look, she's leaving. It is my house. <laughs> don't go. Can you hear me? Don't go. <laughs> it always ends so well, doesn't it, at the minute? These fuck. <laughs> Just wait 30 more seconds. I'm padding out my exit. Right. We're back on Friday with a match preview of Brighton with um, Mikey and Emily. Post match on Sunday, Monday with Kelvin Wilson, and then a panel to be decided at, at 1 pm. This week's been an absolute hell uh, horror show, hasn't it? Sorry. But hopefully, people have enjoyed this. Uh, have a good evening, everyone, and we shall see you soon.